Hey folks, um, don't worry, there isn't supposed to be a picture. I'm just going to be reading the rest of Wildwood that we have left to finish. So we're partway through chapter 21. Um, Prue made it to the Northwood and she's with the Mystics right now trying to ask for help from the big giant tree. And Curtis and all the rest of the bandits and Dimitri the Coyote just made it out of all of their cages and they are on their way creeping out of what was the Coyote Warren. I guess it still is the Coyote Warren, but there are no longer coyotes on it because they all pieced out to go do that creepy sacrifice with the ivy and the baby. So that's where we're at right now. Um, forgive me if I've lost track of what anybody's accent sounded like. It's been a week and a half. I'll try and stick to whatever I pick from here on out. And yeah, grab a craft if you want or something to doodle. There's nothing to see here. And let's have some read aloud. When the escape party arrived at the door to the Warren, they collectively sucked in a massive breath, delirious to be in the air of the above ground world again. All the sweeter after being in that hell hole, said Seamus. Praise be the trees and the air and the woods. Cormac turned to Dimitri. This is where we part ways, friend, he said. I expect you'll be heading back to your pack. Dimitri frowned. It's the left of it, I suppose, he said. But I can't wait to see my litter. Those pups will be grown by now. He extended his forepaw in thanks, and the bandits and Curtis shook it in turn. Goodbye, Dimitri, said Curtis, as the coyote grasped his hand. Ah, Curtis, said Dimitri. If you're ever in need of a fresh scavenged meal, you know where to find me. My warren's west of the long road, by the headwaters of Rock Chair Creek, in the old wood. Look for the broken stone. Call out for me. I'll come find you. Curtis grinned and thanked him. Don't get too wealthy, Dimitri, said Seamus playfully, or our paths will cross again. We bandits quickly return to our true nature. And likewise, don't let your babies wander too far in the night, replied Dimitri, or there'll be dinner. Brendan laughed. Get going, dog. Get home to your pups. Dimitri nodded and dropped to his four paws, began trotting into the underbrush. Before he disappeared, however, Curtis saw him stop and glance down at the tattered uniform that still clung to his frame. With a quick jerk of his muzzle and a shake of his hindquarters, he'd thrown it off, and it fell to the ground in a dirty lump. He gave a quick, joyous howl and vanished into the trees. Curtis felt a hand grip his shoulder. It was Brendan. And I suppose you'll be heading home now, huh, outsider? He thought for a moment before replying. The events of the previous days unspooled in his mind. He found the whole recollection a little dizzying. No, he said, shaking his head. No, I want to come with you. Brendan looked him squarely in the eye. You know what you're getting yourself into? This is a lot bigger than you, kid. I came here to find Mac. I came this close to finding him. Here he held up his thumb and forefinger, nearly touching. Prue's gone home. She's given up, for all I know. I have one last chance. I can't go home now. No way. Very well, Brendan said. Follow us, but don't say I didn't warn you. You may forfeit your life here, boyo. Curtis nodded gravely. I, I know, he said. He peered at Septimus the Rat perched on his shoulder. What about you, Rat? asked Curtis. I'm with you, kid, replied Septimus. There's nothing for me left in the warren. No coyotes means no food to scavenge. He smiled toothily. I go where the food is. Ahead, Angus was already scanning the ground cover. The low-lying ferns and clover that carpeted the forest floor here was trampled flat in great swaths. An army, he said, has passed here. The whole blasted army must have massed here for the march. Look. He pointed to a wide path that had been beaten into the forest leading south. Must have been hundreds of them. A discarded bayonet, rusty from misuse, jutted from a stand of ferns. Brendan picked it up and studied its steely edge. Yep, boys. This is it. Let's move back to camp. Whatever the Dowager plans on doing, she's going to have to fight her way through us to do it. Let's go. He tossed the bayonet into the trees, and the band of freed prisoners made their way towards home. Prue sat calmly in the meadow, watching the robed figures gather. No call was issued, no signal given, 
but the mystics, each engrossed in their own contemplative activity, began slowly arriving of their own volition at their stations. They eventually made a giant circle around the base of the great tree, each figure separated from their neighbor by a distance of roughly 15 feet. Suddenly, and without a word, the robed mystics all sat down on the ground, crossing their legs beneath them as they did so. Prue could see Iphignia sitting between a similarly robed rabbit and deer, stiffen her back and straighten her neck, her eyes closed in deep concentration. The entire circle breathed in unison, and Prue could hear their collective breaths sweeping beneath the low roar of the winds blowing. The meditation had begun. The pace was fast. The bandits moved quietly and stealthily through the trees. After a time, they came to the long road. Checking to see that no sentry had been posted, they began running southward, beckoning Curtis to keep pace. They arrived at the Gap Bridge and crossed, none of them besides Curtis giving so much as a glance to the deep and fathomless darkness of the ravine it spanned. When they came to the other side, they swiftly left the openness of the road and dove headlong into the treed canopy of the forest. Septimus rode on Curtis's shoulder, ducking the odd low-hanging tree branch that threatened to knock him from his perch. What do you think the plan is? He whispered in Curtis's ear. Curtis could barely catch his breath to speak. The bandits traveled so fleetly. They followed paths that were undetectable to his eyes, traced against the forest floor like invisible ink. I don't know, he hissed back at Septimus. We're gathering an army, I think? Septimus whistled between his teeth. I don't know about that, kid, he said. Sounds dangerous. I happen to know that that woman's army is pretty massive. They've been gaining recruits hand over fist. And how do I know this? I eat their garbage. And they make a lot of garbage. Okay, said Curtis, focusing intently on the distant figure of Angus crashing, crashing through the bush. What I mean to say is, it's hopeless. I don't know how many bandits there are, but I doubt it's enough. It ain't gonna be pretty. Thanks, Septimus, said Curtis. Thanks for the vote of confidence. Listen, if you're gonna ride on my shoulder, you can at least keep those kinds of thoughts to yourself. Septimus huffed. Okay, he said, but don't say I didn't warn you. The bandit's momentum came to a stop when they arrived at a small clearing. Brendan stood in the center, searching the treetops. Strange, he was saying as Curtis caught up. No lookout. Where's the cussin' lookout? Curtis followed Brendan's sight line. He saw nothing but strata upon strata of green oak tree leaves and the branches that supported them. Silence filled the glade, disrupted only by the slight rustle of the fern fronds around the bandit's boots. Let's go, commanded Brendan, visibly concerned. His step was slightly lopsided from his limping, but he was still able to move as swiftly as any of his bandit cohorts. After a short distance, the group followed Brendan around the slope of a hillock that masked the mouth of a shallow ravine. Soon, the gully became a small, brook-bottomed valley. Through the underbrush ahead, Curtis saw that the ground leveled into an enormous natural cul-de-sac. As the bracken cleared, an entire camp of canvas tents, rugged lean-tos, and smoldering campfires came into view, populated by a small contingent of milling figures. As soon as the escapee party arrived at the clearing, the camp flew into a commotion. A group of children who'd been busy at a game of marbles came running over. Men carrying a load of firewood dropped their cargo and hollered for joy. Women began appearing from within the little domiciles, clearly overjoyed to see Brendan and the bandits approach. Embraces were shared, stiff handshakes were exchanged. Sloppy, lovelorn kisses between reunited couples were enjoyed. Only Brendan stood away from the group, eyeing the camp. Where is everyone? He said at last. Why are we so few? A young man in a frayed white button-up shirt and suspenders stepped forward. His face showed a deep sorrow. Sorry, King. We've done our best in your absence. What happened? demanded Brendan. The man spoke again. Yesterday evening, the sentries picked up dog soldiers on the perimeter. We sent out a troop. Only Devon returned. Devon, his arm set in a splint, came forward. He walked with some difficulty, his thin frame supported by an improvised tree bough crutch. The rapturous atmosphere of the bandits' reunion had fallen away, and a silence descended over the camp. Devon nodded. 
my king, he said. Brendan stared, glassy-eyed. My king, continued Devon. The far sentry saw him, a few dogs just shy of the periphery. So he went out to give him a little taste. Turned the corner by the fern glade, down by the old creek bed, and ran into the whole army. Devon sniffed a little here, visibly troubled by the memory of the incident. We fought best we could, but we weren't no match for him. There were hundreds of them, sir. Hundreds, all coming from all directions. Never seen so many in my life. We couldn't get away. They had us surrounded. Bryn, Luden, and Mary, all dead. So's Hal. We lost 35 in total. They stalked me down and let me live. Gave me this. Here, he pointed to a jagged claw mark that made a series of three parallel red streaks across his cheek. Said I should let my kin know to stay clear. The young man's voice was fraught with grief. I'm so sorry, King. I know I let you down. Brendan stood, his jaws set firmly in concentration. Have we lost so many? An older man, his brown beard flecked with ribbons of gray, stood apart, his hands on his hips. Aye, King, he said. Between losing these men and all we'd lost in the battle over the ridge, we're in no fit shape to go anywheres. Barely got enough to keep the camp guarded. Remembering himself, Brendan walked up to the wounded man, Devon, and gripped the back of his neck with his hand. He gently pressed his forehead into Devon's, his eyes wet with tears. They won't have died in vain, he said slowly, quietly. We'll avenge their deaths, all of them. A woman stepped from the small crowd at the foot of the clearing. Her coal-black hair was closely cropped, and her earlobes were garlanded with large metal loops. A saber hilt jutted from a wide wrap of silk around her waist, and she rested her ringed hands on the pommel as she spoke. And how do you expect to do that, Brendan? With a what army? We've not enough bandits to rob the country squire coach and four, let alone take on the whole of the Dowager's coyote army. A few of the milling bandits nodded in agreement. No, she continued. We stay put. We wait this out. We've seen as troubled times as this in the great history of our band. We can make it through this. Brendan stepped away from Devon and faced the crowd of bandits. There's nothing to wait out. This is it. He accentuated this statement with a pound of his fist against his open palm. His voice was steely, direct. The dowager's set to raise this whole place, the whole blasted wood. She's feeding the blood of a human outsider child to the ivy. The ivy, lads. And once she's done that, she means to command the vines to consume the whole wood, north and south and wildwood. Gone. Just a big patch of ivy when she's done. A collective murmur of fears erupted from the gathered bandits. What? cried one. How do you know that? Brendan limped to Curtis's side. He put his hand on the shoulder that wasn't occupied by Septimus. This one, he said stonily. This outsider. For the first time since their arrival at the camp, the bandits recognized Curtis. A tempered uproar of objection began to rumble among them. Brendan hushed them, saying, He fought for the Dowager. Yes, indeed, he was a confidant to the witch. But when he told, he was told of her plan. He broke away and was imprisoned. Angus spoke up from the crowd. We met him in that slop bucket of a prison. He aided our escape. He's a friend. His friend is the sister of this child, said Brendan. This baby the dowager plans to sacrifice. If it were not for him, we would not have this information. Someone called from the crowd. But if she controls the ivy, she'll kill us all. Another. And pull down every tree, drown every plant. Aye, that's what she means to do, said Brendan. She's a mad woman, this dowager governess. She means to lay waste to the whole wood and she'll take us down with her. His voice grew calm and he limped forward and away from Curtis, closer to the bandits. So we got two options. One, he held up a single finger. We stay. And at the dawn of the equinox, tomorrow morning... We're swallowed up whole by the ivy, every one of us dead, man, woman, and child. He stared down the rapt crowd, making quick, deliberate eye contact with each bandit. Or two, 
he continued, holding up a second finger. A tattooed snake wound its way around the central knuckle. We fight. We give them everything we've got. And we die, said the earringed woman, her face suddenly resolved and still. Brendan nodded. Yes, Annie, we die. But we die in the fight. And that's a sight better than waiting for the ivy to come and do the job. Quiet settled over the camp. A log of cordwood buckled and popped in one of the fire pits. The sun disappeared behind a haze of clouds. The patter of raindrops descended on the high branches of the surrounding trees. Brendan's tired, desperate eyes traveled over the faces of his compatriots, searching for an answer. Finally, one came. <sighs> we fight, said Annie solemnly. The gathered bandits looked to her and back at Brendan. After a moment, each in turn nodded and intoned those words as well. We fight. <laughs>